Chapter Seven of the Cabalion by Three Initiates. Chapter Seven: The All in All. While all is in the all, it is equally true that the all is in all. To him who truly understands this truth hath come great knowledge. The Cabalion. How often have the majority of people heard repeated the statement that their deity, called by many names, was all in all, and how little have they suspected the inner occult truth concealed by these carelessly uttered words. The commonly used expression is a survival of the ancient hermetic maxim quoted above. As the Kabbalion says, to him who truly understands this truth hath come great knowledge. And this being so, let us seek this truth, the understanding of which means so much. In this statement of truth, this hermetic maxim, is concealed one of the greatest philosophical, scientific and religious truths. We have given you the hermetic teaching regarding the mental nature of the universe, the truth that the universe is mental, held in the mind of the All. As the Kabbalion says, in the passage quoted above, All is in the All. But note also the co-related statement, that it is equally true that the All is in All. This apparently contradictory statement is reconcilable under the law of paradox. It is, moreover, an exact hermetic statement of the relations existing between the All and its mental universe. We have seen how All is in the All. Now let us examine the other aspect of the subject. The hermetic teachings are to the effect that the All is immanent in, remaining within, inherent abiding within, its universe, and in every part, particle, unit or combination within the universe. This statement is usually illustrated by the teachers by a reference to the principle of correspondence. The teacher instructs the student to form a mental image of something, a person, an idea, something having a mental form, the favourite example being that of the author or dramatist forming an idea of his characters, or a painter or sculptor forming an image of an ideal that he wishes to express by his art. In each case, the student will find that while the image has its existence and a being solely within his own mind, yet he, the student, author, dramatist, painter or sculptor, is in a sense imminent in, remaining within or abiding within, the mental image also. In other words, the entire virtue, life, spirit of reality in the mental image is derived from the imminent mind of the thinker. Consider this for a moment until the idea is grasped. To take a modern example, let us say that Othello, Iago, Hamlet, Lear, Richard III, existed merely in the mind of Shakespeare at the time of their conception or creation, and yet Shakespeare also existed within each of these characters, giving them their vitality, spirit and action. Whose is the spirit of the characters that we know as Micawber, Oliver Twist, Uriah Heep, is it Dickens, or have each of these characters a personal spirit, independent of their creator? Have the Venus of Medici, the Sistine Madonna, the Apollo Belvedere, spirits and reality of their own, or do they represent the spiritual and mental power of their creators? The law of paradox explains that both propositions are true, viewed from the proper viewpoints. Micawber is both Micawber and yet Dickens. And again, while Micawber may be said to be Dickens, yet Dickens is not identical with Micawber. Man, like Micawber, may exclaim, The spirit of my creator is inherent within me, and yet I am not he. How different this from the shocking half-truth, so vociferously announced by certain of the half-wise, who fill the air with their raucous cries of, I am God. Imagine poor Micawber, or the sneaky Uriah Heep, crying, I am Dickens, or some of the lowly clods in one of Shakespeare's plays, grandiloquently announcing that I am Shakespeare. The all is in the earthworm, and yet the earthworm is far from being the all. And still the wonder remains, that though the earthworm exists merely as a lowly thing, created and having its being solely within the mind of the all, yet the all is imminent in the earthworm, and in the particles that go to make up the earthworm. Can there be any greater mystery than this of all in the all? 
and the all in all? The student will, of course, realize that the illustrations given above are necessarily imperfect and inadequate, for they represent the creation of mental images in finite minds, while the universe is a creation of infinite mind, and the difference between the two poles separates them. And yet it is merely a matter of degree. The same principle is in operation. The principle of correspondence manifests in each. As above, so below. As below, so above. And in the degree that man realizes the existence of the indwelling spirit imminent within his being, so will he rise in the spiritual scale of life. This is what spiritual development means, the recognition, realization and manifestation of the spirit within us. Try to remember this last definition, that of spiritual development. It contains the truth of true religion. There are many planes of being, many sub-planes of life many degrees of existence in the universe, and all depend upon the advancement of beings in the scale, of which scale the lowest point is the grossest matter, the highest being separated only by the thinnest division from the spirit of the all. And upward and onward along this scale of life, everything is moving. All are on the path, whose end is the all. All progress is returning home. All is upward and onward, in spite of all seemingly contradictory appearances. Such is the message of the Illumined. The Hermetic teachings concerning the process of the mental creation of the universe are that, at the beginning of the creative cycle, the All, in its aspect of being, projects its will toward its aspect of becoming, and the process of creation begins. It is taught that the process consists of the lowering of vibration until a very low degree of vibratory energy is reached at which point the grossest possible form of matter is manifested. This process is called the stage of involution, in which the all becomes involved or wrapped up in its creation. This process is believed by the hermetists to have a correspondence to the mental process of an artist, writer or inventor, who becomes so wrapped up in his mental creation as to almost forget his own existence and who, for the time being, almost lives in his creation. Instead of being wrapped, we use the word wrapped. Perhaps we will give a better idea of what is meant. This involuntary stage of creation is sometimes called the outpouring of the divine energy, just as the evolutionary state is called the indrawing. The extreme pole of the creative process is considered to be the furthest removed from the all, while the beginning of the evolutionary stage is regarded as the beginning of the return swing of the pendulum of rhythm, a coming home idea being held in all of the Hermetic teachings. The teachings are that during the outpouring the vibrations become lower and lower until finally the urge ceases and the return swing begins. But there is this difference that while in the outpouring the creative forces manifest compactly and as a whole, yet from the beginning of the evolutionary or indrawing stage there is manifested the law of individualization, that is, the tendency to separate into units of force, so that finally that which left the all as unindividualized energy returns to its source as countless highly developed units of life, having risen higher and higher in the scale by means of physical, mental and spiritual evolution. The ancient hermetists used the word meditation in describing the process of the mental creation of the universe in the mind of the all the word contemplation also being frequently employed. But the idea intended seems to be that of the employment of the divine attention. Attention is a word derived from the Latin root, meaning to reach out, to stretch out. And so the act of attention is really a mental reaching out, extension of mental energy, so that the underlying idea is readily understood when we examine into the real meaning of attention. The Hermetic teachings regarding the process of evolution are that the All, having meditated upon the beginning of the creation, having thus established the material foundations of the universe, having thought it into existence, then gradually awakens or rouses from its meditation and in so doing starts into manifestation the process of evolution on the material, mental and spiritual planes, successively and in order. Thus the upward movement begins and all begins to move spiritward. 
matter becomes less gross the units spring into being the combinations begin to form life appears and manifests in higher and higher forms and mind becomes more and more in evidence the vibrations constantly becoming higher in short the entire process of evolution in all of its phases begins and proceeds according to the established laws of the indrawing process all of this occupies eons upon eons of man's time each eon containing countless millions of years but yet the illumined inform us that the entire creation including involution and evolution of an universe is but as the twinkle of the eye to the all at the end of countless cycles of eons of time the all withdraws its attention its contemplation and meditation of the universe for the great work is finished and all is withdrawn into the all from which it emerged but mystery of mysteries the spirit of each soul is not annihilated but is infinitely expanded the created and the creator emerged such is the report of the illumined the above illustration of the meditation and subsequent awakening from meditation of the all is of course but an attempt of the teachers to describe the infinite process by a finite example and yet as below so above the difference is merely in degree and just as the all arouses itself from the meditation upon the universe so does man in time cease from manifesting upon the material plane and withdraws himself more and more into the indwelling spirit which is indeed the divine ego there is one more matter of which we desire to speak in this lesson and that comes very near to an invasion of the metaphysical field of speculation although our purpose is merely to show the futility of such speculation we allude to the question which inevitably comes to the mind of all thinkers who have ventured to seek the truth the question is why does the all create universes the question may be asked in different forms but the above is the gist of the inquiry men have striven hard to answer this question but there is still no answer worthy of the name some have imagined that the all had something to gain by it but this is absurd for what could the all gain that it did not already possess others have sought the answer in the idea that the all wished something to love and others that it created for pleasure or amusement or because it was lonely or to manifest its power all puerile explanations and ideas belonging to the childish period of thought others have sought to explain the mystery by assuming that the all found itself compelled to create by reason of its own internal nature its creative instinct this idea is an advance of the others but its weak point lies in the idea of the all being compelled by anything internal or external if its internal nature or creative instinct compelled it to do anything then the internal nature or creative instinct would be the absolute instead of the all and so accordingly that part of the proposition falls and yet the all does create and manifest and seems to find some kind of satisfaction in so doing and it is difficult to escape the conclusion that in some infinite degree it must have what would correspond to an inner nature or creative instinct in man with correspondingly infinite desire and will it could not act unless it willed to act and it would not will to act unless it desired to act and it would not desire to act unless it obtained some satisfaction thereby and all of these things would belong to an inner nature and might be postulated as existing according to the law of correspondence but still we prefer to think of the all as acting entirely free from any influence internal as well as external that is the problem which lies at the root of difficulty and the difficulty that lies at the root of the problem strictly speaking there cannot be said to be any reason whatsoever for the all to act for a reason implies a cause and the all is above cause and effect except when it wills to become a cause at which time the principle is set into motion so you see the matter is unthinkable just as the all is unknowable just as we say the all merely is so we are compelled to say that the all acts because it acts at the last the all is all reason in itself all law in itself all action in itself 
and it may be said truthfully that the all is its own reason its own law its own act or still further that the all its reason its act is law are one all being names for the same thing in the opinion of those who are giving you these present lessons the answer is locked up in the inner self of the all along with its secret of being the law of correspondence in our opinion reaches only to that aspect of the all which may be spoken of as the aspect of becoming back of that aspect is the aspect of being in which all laws are lost in law all principles merge into principle and the all principle and being are identical one and the same therefore metaphysical speculation on this point is futile we go into the matter here merely to show that we recognize the question and also the absurdity of the ordinary answers of metaphysics and theology in conclusion it may be of interest to our students to learn that while some of the ancient and modern hermetic teachers have rather inclined in the direction of applying the principle of correspondence to the question with the result of the inner nature conclusion still the legends have it that hermes the great when asked this question by his advanced students answered them by pressing his lips tightly together and saying not a word indicating that there was no answer but then he may have intended to apply the axiom of his philosophy that the lips of wisdom are closed except to the ears of understanding believing that even his advanced students did not possess the understanding which entitled them to the teaching at any rate if hermes possessed the secret he failed to impart it and so far as the world is concerned the lips of hermes are closed regarding it and where the great hermes hesitated to speak what mortal may dare to teach but remember that whatever be the answer to this problem if indeed there be an answer the truth remains that while the all is in the all it is equally true that the all is in all the teaching on this point is emphatic and we may add the concluding words of the quotation to him who truly understands this truth hath come great knowledge End of chapter 7 of the Kabbalion by Three Initiates